Welcome. You're listening to Latin Waves with your host Sylvia and Stuart Richardson. Latin Waves is more than just hot rhythms. This is a show about community, about creating a culture that is inclusive and based on fairness. Because everyone deserves dignity, respect, and has something to contribute. A new world is possible, and it all starts with us. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Jesse Friston. He's a filmmaker. As a filmmaker, I, I, I appreciate not only having seen your growth, because I met you when you were just a kid, 19 years old, and, <laughs> and, and even then, you inspire me. You were someone who seems so pregnant with life, you know, pregnant with uh, enthusiasm for life. And I think that's really what social movement need. It's a sense of energy, you know, this energy, this commitment, really. And to me, sacredness just means that, a commitment, a devotion to life. We can look at our history. We can look at the history of imperialism. We can look at the history of colonization. You can look at the history of mass oppression through markets and juridical instruments of sanction and, you know, invasion. All of that is there. And also, I think we can, and I, I feel, we can feel our way as you have demonstrated for us, through the resistance, you know, the fight of the Awan Valley was one that you brought to our attention. The struggle and the uprising of the Wasuetan people, you know, the movements across Canada of countless who have a multitude of beautiful projects in gestation, you know, whether it be political representation, whether it be housing, whether it be clean water to indigenous community, whether it be education, all are amazing places where we can all find a home. So how do you invite uh, new people to, to feel your enthusiasm, to, you know, to share that beautiful energy that you bring to your projects? This is uh, one of my favorite places to, to talk about, the, about my work. It's with you because we get into like this kind of like holistic way of thinking about things and not just, the political or the economic and all that stuff. So I, I, I think for me, in terms of organization at this stage, like one of the things that I don't see organizations tapping into enough is the ability for us to take advantage of the internet to grow our capacities as individuals. So like one of the ways you can feel like you belong is a, inside an organization is is that you are growing, that you're learning how to do something very well um, and becoming really useful. And, and I think, um, and I try to say this without, without too much judgment, but I think there's a real, a real opportunity for our movements not just to be unified by, like, I think that there's been a real focus on us unifying around the language we use, the way we talk about the issues, the way we talk about our reality, and that that is what creates our cohesion. But it would be really nice to see us involving a bunch of different people with different skills and for example saying you know okay our movement needs uh somebody who's really good at web design so who here you know feels impassioned by that or does anybody know somebody who has that passion but right now doesn't have a community or doesn't have uh, a way to plug into the world and can we get them involved and then and then they can use YouTube tutorials and stuff like this and check in with us and have us as the, the, uh, the movement, the group, the organization as a place where they get to show off this, their own, their development in, in this era area and things like this. Uh, you, it could go for anything. It could go for video. It could go for dance. Like we're, oh, we're going to do political theater. Who here loves to do, who here loved drama when they were in school? Um, you know, and, uh, do you want to like look into maybe finding a, a nice piece of political theater that we could practice and, uh, and you could be the director. We've got this incredible access to, to knowledge and skills, um, through the internet. And I, and I feel like we're not always tapping into it. And there's a great potential beauty there to make really powerful movements full of people who really feel like they're growing inside the movement and uh, are growing their skills and their, their connection to everybody. And, and, you know, I think that would be really nice to see more of that. 
I love that you see the connection between art and political activism. You know, in Latin America, uh, one of the things that really moved me is that in the midst of a war, uh, people were having dances. You know, we were having um, block parties and people were showing up uh, to different events with a sense of enthusiasm. You know, yes, the war is a real threat and yes, the violence was palpable and also was people's connection to life, just like this sense of life is here, you know what I mean? And if we only have one day, live that day really well. Um, can, I, I wonder if you... You know, I, I got to know El Salvador long after you had left, and but got to spend a lot of time with people who'd lived that war, who'd fought in it, um, particularly in the north in Chatanango. Um, and, you know, it's so... It was so funny, like, you know, there was, you mentioned mining in El Salvador. Well, there hasn't been industrial mining in El Salvador because that movement's been extremely successful um, at, at keeping the mining companies out. Like, that's been a huge success story. When you, when you get in there and you meet these people who live that civil war and they find out that there's a mining company that wants to come in and take this land that they, that they lost life over, that they lost family over um, defending, it's really fascinating to see the lightness with which they do that battle. Um, and like, I, like I'm thinking, I'm just remembering uh, this one woman, Suyapa, telling me the story about when she had the idea. So they, the company had gone around putting these flags around uh, prospector flags or whatever. Um, the geologists had gone around like a potential markers for areas. Maybe, I don't know what the flags meant or the markers meant. And, they had put these markers on the ground and then the helicopter could see the markers, I guess, and they would map from above or something like this. And so yep, I learned about how this works. And then she, she told everybody, you know, Hey, I've got an idea. Like, why don't we just organize like all the youth and stuff and get everybody a shovel and we'll just spread out from the town and we'll bury all those markers. And, you know, she tells this story with like such joy. And so we did it. And then the next time the chopper came around, we were all laughing because it was just circling and circling and circling and couldn't find anything. And, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I think of another, of another story in Cabanas where they also defeated a mining project. Um, and the mining company had tried to, well, to organize a, well, did organize a soccer tournament, you know, to, to get people on side for the mining project. And, and the winners were going to get, uh, I forget everything they got, but one of the things they got was a, a t-shirt for Pacific Rim, which is the mining, the mining company at the time. And, and the, the people who were against the mining company got together a team of like, you know, the best players in town and they went in and won the tournament and, and then like, and they were wearing, uh, you know, anti-mining shirts. And then when they, they were given the, the, the t-shirts as winners, the Pacific Rim t-shirts, and they were ready with, I think it was uh, tape, I guess, or, or paint or something. And they are markers and they, I can't remember, but they put Fuera Pacific Rim. So like Pacific Rim, get out <laughs> like on the t-shirt. And then they took the picture with the, with the vice president of uh, public relations or whatever for Pacific Rim, you know, and you could see he's there like unhappy and there's the winning team with their Fuera Pacific Rim t-shirt. Um, you know, I, I, there's just a, you know, you, you brought it up. So I'm just piggybacking on it. Just this, I, I saw the, the, the possibility for create like pure creativity and joy in the face of threat, like serious threat and how essential that is to keeping that alive. Yeah. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. I love that um, you were there and I love that you've seen um, the place where I grew up. You know, and, and in many ways, I think sometimes we don't have to see the place to fall in love with the people who struggle to keep places alive. And that really is what the struggle is today, is to keep, you know, the lifeblood of our earth, you know, flowing, you know, to keep water from being contaminated, to keep people from dying of starvation, to keep people from you know, perishing because they lose hope. And my mother always says hopelessness precedes disease. And to me, um, that means that even in a world that is wanting of so many things, you know, we have to cultivate a sense of 
presence, you know, a sense of power by how we engage with life, how we invite life in. And um, I love that you do it through film. I love that you write stories. I love that you've been part of um, dances and movements that celebrate, you know, um, their ability to see the vision of a different society in the face of terror, in the face of, you know, illness. So how did you uh, find this path? Because I imagine there's a lot of young people out there who'd like, oh, you know, film will be great. How did you find your way into this beautiful path of telling story, becoming a storyteller, but a storyteller that is very focused on the vision of a world with justice? I think... Well, for me, I think, you know, different people will have different paths. And mine was just always one of, of curiosity and some sort of combination of curiosity and work ethic. So I, I think it's, it's hard. I spent a lot of hours alone making terrible videos, like a lot, like a lot of time making, shooting poorly, editing poorly, and 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 just and just keep go keep going. Um, I think uh, you know, fail harder would be a would be a good slogan <laughs> for for making it in, in an industry like this. I, I did it. I did my early stuff. I did along with a, a very close friend and and very talented who's become a very talented storyteller and filmmaker named Leah Tarachansky. Um And Leah and I started out together making terrible terrible videos. And we, you know, we pushed each other and laughed together, and and uh, and I think that that camaraderie was very important to me. I don't, I don't know if I would have made it through those early years. I might have, I might have uh, bailed on the whole project. I mean, it was it was so beautiful doing it with her that I didn't even realize I was like on a career path. You know, was, we were just having fun and following our curiosities. You know, and so if you're somebody who is always asking why, you know, who, who finds simple narratives unfulfilling, um, who loves meeting new people and, and things like this, then, then, then nonfiction uh, storytelling might, might be a really great place for you, for you to go. It's definitely um, not a place where, you, where you're going to make a lot of money and, and that's fine as long as you're, as long as you're very aware that you're going to get your, satisfaction out of other things and out of the meeting of new people and out of getting to talk to people like Sylvia, um, then, then I think it's, then you, you, you might have what it, you probably have what it mainly really takes. I think at least to follow the path that I went. Yeah. I would say, and then if you're somebody who prefers to create more of the introverted side, you're, you're more about creating worlds. Then I think fiction is more for you probably um, in the film world or in the, in the writing world. And, uh, or maybe you could be a really good researcher and be part of a team who's doing nonfiction. But I think the path I went on is definitely a path for, for the curious extrovert um, who's, who's willing to fail over and over and over again, <laughs> is how I would put it. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I learned so much of what, I, of what I've managed to pick up through YouTube um, and through YouTube tutorials. Uh, Every time I teach a workshop on shooting or editing or lighting or whatever, I always start it off with a little bit of, of what's the best way to use YouTube tutorials or like how to search things. I do a little three minutes on that. And I think that's an incredible resource that anybody who's trying to learn anything today should, should be tapping into. Um, and you can even write, you know, these, these creators, sometimes they'll, they'll answer your questions. If you have a specific question, write to them, write to them in the comments, um, whatever it might be. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great that's that's a great place to be. But find find a partner, find somebody who you want to do it with, or or, or two people, or whatever. Um, you know, don't do it don't do it alone if you don't have to. But if you have to do it alone, go ahead. If you're <laughs> if you're really isolated or whatever it might be, then then that could be a beautiful thing too. But uh, for me, it was really nice to have Leah with me for the for the trip, and then and then from then on, it's been other people and collaborating. And I just try to always. And you try to force myself consciously to be aware of what somebody's doing well and make note of it. Uh, I've never been a big fan of like the term be yourself. Like I always think like be who you want to be, <laughs> you know, and sometimes, so when you see somebody who's doing something really well, you know, 
take note, take note of, of how they're doing it. And I also take a lot of notes when I watch films When I watch other films, I go, I'll write down the things I liked and the things I didn't like afterwards. And so that's just how I learn. I, I write things down and then I can see them in my mind's eye a bit clearer and it allows me to clear my thoughts. I, I don't know. These are, these would be a few, just a few thoughts I would have. I love that um, what you're sharing is not just a, a, a road path to becoming an amazing filmmaker, but also the road path to becoming someone who truly lives and breathes joy in their life. You know, it's like, it's not that life is easy. It's, life has never made a promise mm -hmm. that it will be easy. If you ask anyone in Latin America, they, you know, they will all, you'll find people smiling despite having lived through, you know, decades of war and hunger and all kinds of things. But the reason we smile is because with every struggle, you learn something. With every challenge, you are forced to stretch to, find new powers that were within you that you didn't even know you had in you so your ability to find Leo to the ability to find partners to play with to grow with to you know that's something that you've been cultivating and I think that's a, a, a magical power of yours I love for you to talk a little bit about your projects because you have amazing films that you have created I mean of course my one of my favorites is Resistencia the fight for the Awan Valley because it It tells the story of a people who, despite a coup d'etat, you know, that brought down their government, their elected government, they created um, something in the midst of, you know, the, the threat of violence. Um, but you've, you've also written, you know, many stories, you know, the story of African people and how the crisis in Africa is a crisis for humanity as a whole. So tell us a little bit about your projects. What are you focusing on? How can people connect with you, work with you, support your work? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, right now you're catching me at a moment where there's a lot of, uh, there was a big rupture in 2020, right? There's a couple of projects that would have been released in 2020 that I wasn't able to finish because of, of the restrictions. So they're not out yet. And then, and then some of the, the, the soul searching and thinking I did in 2020 led to new projects. Um, I have a, a podcast I do right now that we started during 2020 with my friend, Billy Bunton. Uh, who's an old friend from Washington, D.C., a great storyteller. He does his stories through cartoons and animation. And we basically, uh, we launched a podcast called Where Is Now? Um, and what we try to do with that is we just basically looked at like our, our secular world and realized that, you know, Billy and I had both kind of like dabbled in Christianity as children and then had grown up to become more agnostic and atheist and then are now finding ourselves a little bit open-minded to all kinds of different stories as models. And we realized, you know, that, that one of the values in a lot of religions is they take some great people and they say, these people are models of, of how to be a certain way. And let's study them and figure out how to be, whether it be Jesus, Muhammad, Mary, um, you know, whoever it might be. And let's the Buddha and let's, let's study them and, and figure out how to be more like them. And, and so we were, we were looking at uh, our world. And so we, and saying, well, let's take real people uh, and let's study them as models for what, like, what can they offer us in terms of a model of how we could be as individuals and, 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 and how we work as groups and, and their ideas and their values and how that would point us maybe towards a better world. And so we don't always do it as people that we think sh should be emulated. Um, you know, we did one on the landlord actually. So, that, so we do a lot on, on actual individuals like Helen Keller or Michael Jordan or Dave Chappelle, but we also do ones on like, uh, you know, concepts like the landlord, like who is the landlord? What's their psychology like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and should we all want to be landlords? Um, you know, it's, 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 we, we try to have a lot of fun with it. That's a big, that's a project that, that I'm, that Billy and I are working on. Uh, I think we're up to like episode 10 now. Um, but most of the stuff I'm working on, I can't talk about yet, but there is, I will let you guys know that we are going to be launching myself and some other kind of, uh, progressive, um, critical, uh, writers and, and video makers are going to try to be launching a media project in April, probably, um, to fill what we think is a big gap in the Canadian media landscape, um, which is to, for a place like in the U S there's Vox 
is an example of this. In the UK, they have Novara Media. Um, these are places which which make short videos, podcasts, um, uh, written pieces, some investigative, but mostly just trying to give a, a critical analysis of something that's happening. And this became very clear when we were working in, on Wet'suwet'en territory, um, that we were pumping out these videos and they were creating quite a, a response in the media. But one thing that we didn't find was if you went on YouTube, for example, and you looked up Wet'suwet'en during that, ter- during that moment, you would get, you know, CBC coverage, um, you know, middle, sort of middle of the road trying to, oh, what's really going on or whatever. But not, without much history, without much critical analysis, or you would get these kind of right-wing vloggers who were spreading a lot of misinformation, uh, a lot of repeating of, of uh, dangerous myths and misunderstandings. There wasn't like a left alternative to that, um, a place that really values curiosity of really not finding out what's going on and not exaggerating things to win a political point, but taking what's there and then giving a critical analysis and one that points towards a different future, one that accepts that the current status quo is not acceptable um, and and is trying to be a, a meaningful place uh, for people to, to get analysis and hear different voices um, relating to that. So that project is called The Breach. We just decided on, this is the first time I'm saying the name publicly. <laughs> the name was just decided on uh, the end of last week. So look for that coming up. But in terms of my work in general, um, my video work, it's at jessefreeston.com. And uh, people can always reach me by email uh, at me at jessefreeston.com. And, um, and I'm other places on the internet too. And I'm the, up till now the only person on the internet with my name. So fairly easy to find. So J-E-S-S-E and then F-R-E-E-S-T-O-N. You are such an amazing force of creativity and an amazing example also of how solidarity is such a wonderful path to flourishing, you know, not just in your creative passion projects, but also as, as, a, as a, you know, in your power, right? Your sense of agency and power and who we are and what we can be together is so much greater than thinking we have to go alone, you know, then isolating and feeling uh, like the weight of the world is too much on our shoulders. So as we come to a close, um, what inspiring story would you like to leave our audience with or what what has been perhaps an inspiring story that you go to when you feel that, you know, that energy, because we all have those days when it's a little dark outside and the news, the news is all gloom and doom. So how do you re-energize? How do you inoculate against fear? Ooh, that's such a good good question and it's such a true thing uh i i definitely have a lot of a lot of dark days and and like a lot of people and i would say my most successful place is two i would say two things and they're very different so one i would call realistic optimism so i like a lot of hip-hop for example that finds uh that gets you dancing while also talking about dark stuff (laughs) it's like i um I like to, I don't, I don't like to pretend I'm not in a dark period. I like to kind of embrace it a little bit, process it, go through it. Uh, so I'll listen to somebody like an Anderson Pack, a song like Celebrate, um, you know, where, you know, let, let's, let's dance. At least we're not dead. Let's just dance for that. <laughs> something, um, somebody, something like Brother Ali and uh, he has a song called The Puzzle. Uh, these, are, these are songs which give me a lot of power in those moments, I think. Uh, through this this lens, which is not just in hip hop and or in even in music, but you can find in a lot of places, which I call realistic optimism, which is genuinely taking on the situation and finding finding some sort of optimistic angle to it. Um, but then another another place I go is laughter, and even even deeply cynical laughter. Um, whatever gets the laughter out, and often that'll be through like satire. One a book I've read probably twenty times is uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's just an absolutely absurd, ridiculous sci-fi satire <laughs> on, on on humans in the world in the galaxy. I uh, yeah, I really I think those are those are things I go. If I really if I really want to get cute, I, I'll read The Little Prince again. <laughs> that book that book will never let you down. Um, 
I'll put on, uh, if I really want to feel something deeper and really process it, maybe I'll put on a radio head up on, turn out all the lights, put the, wear my like big headphones and lie down with my eyes closed and listen to a whole radio head album and just go through that. And my main thing is, which is, not, which has kind of been sealed off to me at this point, but is, uh, is playing basketball. And, uh, that's, that's like the only, that's like the most consistent passion I've had in my life. I think is, is for basketball. It's never really left. And, um, I don't know, getting together with some other people, uh, often with whom the only thing we share is a love of basketball and, and we get together and we, and for two hours, we try to put a little ball in a hoop against five other people. I'm, I'm able, I'm always able to completely focus on that mission <laughs> for two hours, uh, without fail, no matter how, how rough a time I'm in or, um, that's always been a sanctuary for me. And, uh, it's probably the thing I've most missed, uh, during this lockdown that we're in here in Montreal. But yeah, those, that's my, that's my almost complete list of the things I do when I'm in a, when it's dark spot beyond, beyond talking to, to close friends, people, the people, particularly ones that have known me for a long time um, and that I've known them. And, and hopefully we, we do, we talk about it in a way that, you know, sometimes if it's, you're really processing something rough, it's like you do most of the talking that day or they do most of the talking and, and the other person just listening. But my favorite way to process things is like to co-process you know, with somebody where, where we're both making our way through something together and uh, reflecting on each other's thoughts and paths. That is so brilliant. I love you. I love the way, I love that we <laughs> share our love of basketball, by the way. Uh, but I, I also love that you understand so intimately the relationship with our body and our spirit is one. You know, and you can be an effective, in my opinion, and this is my humble opinion, you can be an effective leader if you don't have that connection right. If you're always in your head, if you're always in strategy and in anticipating your opponent and you forget that you're also a physical being that needs connection, that needs touch, that needs exercise, that needs nourishment, that needs rest, you know, our efforts are not going to be as flourishing as what they can be when we mm -hmm. attend to all those. So thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. This has been great. You're a beautiful person. Thank you so much. It's, and I hope uh -huh. you too. I hope people keep on supporting you and your projects. Oh, thank you. Uh, we need you out here. I appreciate you. Uh, so for more information, go to jessiefriston.com and we look forward to your beautiful project, Bridge, and your podcast. Please tell our audience how they can reach your podcast again. Yeah, it's called Where Is Now? And, uh, and it's on all the places people get their podcasts. Thank you again for being with us, Jesse. Have a great day. Yeah, a real pleasure. Take care, Sylvia. Take care. We've come to the end of our show, Latin Waves. Latin Waves is an internationally syndicated weekly program made available through campus and community stations and available out to the world at www.latinwavesmedia.com. Visit Latin Waves Media to hear previous shows to access resources or support our efforts towards social change via community project engagement. Thank you and bye for now.